Welcome to Earth Science Lecture. This is Professor Dianelle Pomeroy. Today we're going to be learning about volcanoes. Volcanoes are hills or mountains that have a central magma chamber within the volcano. It, remember that magma is a pool of molten rock uh, that exists on Earth's surface and in the mantle of the Earth. And so in some cases, when magma rises to the surface, it will form inside uh, these structures. So volcanoes that have an active magma chamber, which is where the magma is molten and it's superheated and it's constantly moving, those volcanoes are classified as active. And they're more likely to erupt at any time. They usually have some timing with their eruptions, but as with any major tectonic event on our surface, it's not necessarily a guarantee as to when it's going to occur. So we can't really predict with any certainty when a volcanic eruption will take place. Volcanoes that have a magma chamber that's partially solidified, so some of that magma has solidified into an igneous rock, let's say an intrusive rock like granite. In that instance, that volcano would be considered dormant, which means that, like the term dormos uh, sleep, so the volcano is not really active per se. It's not constantly being heated, but it can erupt at any time as well. It's just not as likely to erupt as active volcanoes do. In terms of volcanoes that have a completely solidified magma chamber, so the magma chamber is completely developed into, say, an intrusive rock like granite, in that case, those volca volcanoes are considered extinct, and in which case they don't erupt. So they just stop erupting altogether, and the volcano itself essentially becomes a mountain at that point. All the volcanoes that we see on this slide are all volcanoes that are in California. Uh, Mount Lassen, which is a lava dome type, and then we have Mount Shasta, again, similar uh, type. Both of those two volcanoes, Mount Shasta is in black and white here, and Mount Lassen is in color. Um, both of those volcanoes are in Northern California, really closer to the border between California and Oregon, uh, part of the Cascade Range of volcanoes. Um, section of the Cascade Range actually connects all the way up to Washington, which is where uh, Mount St. Helens exists. And so these two volcanoes, Mount Lassen and Mount Shasta, are part of that complex. And then to the east, we have not only the Sierra Nevada granites, which I mentioned to you last class with the batholith, uh, but we've also got an active volcano here um, in Houston, California, which is known as Mammoth Mountain. So Mammoth Mountain, the ski resort, that destination is actually part of an active volcano complex. It's located in the Mono County area, so if you've never been to Mammoth, uh, it's in East Central California near Yosemite National Park. So Mammoth Mountain is, on, is the last uh, mountain pictured on the slide. It's part of the Inyo Valley area. So all three of these volcanoes are considered active volcanoes here in California. Um, again, Mount Lassen and Mount Shasta are in Northern California, and Mammoth Mountain is in Eastern California. Volcanoes erupt at different rates, and this happens due to differences in the chemistry of the magma and lava that are produced during the volcanic eruption. The volcanoes that were all featured on the previous slide that are in California, they all have what are known as rhyolitic or felsic lavas. And so as a result of their chemistry, they tend to have this really explosive eruption style. That's due not only to the pressure and temperature differentials inside the volcano, but it's also due to that chemical reaction that occurs when we add heat and pressure to the rocks themselves. So recall that we've got differences in partial melting, and that's different rates of when, that, when those minerals will melt off in magma solution. So we've got different partial melting rates. Remember that we've got decompression melting and flux melting. And in terms of our volcanoes here in California that still exist in Northern California specifically, we're looking at more of a subduction zone type volcano. Mammoth Mountain formed a little bit differently. Uh, that volcano formed from the development of the Basin and Range a series of mountains. Uh, that event developed that particular type of volcano. So we've got differences in the chemistry of our magmas and also our resulting lavas. And this goes back to Bowen's reaction series. 
So recall with that, we've got two major categories of minerals. We classify according to where and, and how they form in the Earth's crust and mantle. So we've got mafic minerals or dark silicates, things like olivine, pyroxene, amphibole. Those minerals form at greater depths, pressures, and temperatures inside the Earth. On the other hand, we've got felsic minerals. Those light silicates tend to form closer to the surface of the Earth. So with those minerals, we tend to get more potassium feldspar and quartz that will form from that magma or lava solution. And so felsic minerals form at lower temperatures and pressures. So it turns out that if you have, say, a volcano that's got a ultra mafic magma, so in other words, the magma has almost entirely 100% mafic mineral composition, that will produce a mafic lava that erupts. And on this chart, we have differences in our mafic lavas. So our mafic lavas tend to form at 1160 degrees Celsius. That's thousands of degrees Fahrenheit, um, just for the sake of comparison. So that's a very hot uh, lava that is produced from that type of volcano. On the other hand, you have volcanoes where the magma chamber has a mafic magma. If it's just a mafic magma, when that eruption event occurs, what's produced are going to be our felsic or intermediate type lavas. And on this chart, we've got some felsic lavas like rhyolite that are developing at a lower temperature. So these tend to form, again, due to lower temperature conditions. They have a greater silica content. And as a result, this causes differences in how the lava will flow. So the chemistry of lava is important, not only for the temperature that's being developed, how hot that lava is as it erupts, but also has to do with the resistance to flow, the viscosity of that material. Keep in mind also that at different boundary points, decompression melting versus flux melting, for example, you get different types of minerals that form from that lava solution, and also different types of extrusive igneous rocks will result uh, from these flows as well. Viscosity is a substance's ability to essentially resist flow. So that means that whenever we have substances that resist flow, they're not going to flow well at all. The higher the viscosity of a substance, the slower it's going to move. And generally, the more thick that the substance is to begin with. So if we've got low viscosity substance, that means that the substance is going to be thinner and it's going to flow much faster, much more readily across a given area or location. So let me give you some examples of everyday things that have differences in viscosity. A substance that has a high viscosity is toothpaste. Toothpaste is a gel. It's thick and it moves pretty slowly. And the only way for toothpaste to come out of a toothpaste tube is if you apply pressure to it. And this is in a similar way to how felsic lavas erupt. They have a higher viscosity. You have to apply a lot of pressure in order for that to come out. Water, on the other hand, doesn't have that same viscosity. Water has a much lower viscosity. So water is a lot thinner, and it tends to just flow everywhere. So if I were to take, say, a water bottle, fill it up with water, and take another water bottle and fill it up with toothpaste, in order for the water to come out, all I have to do is tip over the water bottle and just flows everywhere. So there's no resistance there. It's got a low viscosity. Whereas if I try to do the same thing with the toothpaste, you're going to be staying there with the water bottle upside down for a while. It's going to take a long time for the toothpaste to come out. And again, this has to do with viscosity differences. Now, this also has a difference in terms of how heat and pressure interact within the substance. Generally, substances that have a greater viscosity, because they resist flow, they're more readily able to trap heat and gas. And so because of this, if you were to heat a water bottle in a microwave, for example, that's full of toothpaste, it's more likely to explode than if you heat a water bottle that's filled with water. That's because lower viscosity substances allow for gases to escape because these substances, again, allow for that flow. So in much the same way, we get different types of volcanoes that develop because of these differences in lava chemistry and their viscosities. When we have a shield volcano that produces a mafic lava type eruption, what happens is, is that the lava will just flow across the landscape. So as the lava flows across the landscape, it will develop into lava tubes 
or potentially like entire chambers or fissures that will extend across the landscape for miles. And we see this with the Hawaiian Islands specifically. Uh, those islands are developed through a series of these types of volcanic eruptions over time. Also keep in mind that with mafic lavas, remember that mafic minerals tend to have more magnesium and iron in their content, in their chemical content. And so as a result, this also influences how the eruption takes place and how readily these lavas will flow across the landscape. With a felsic lava, on the other hand, it's kind of like our toothpaste example. So what happens is, is that inside a volcano that has a felsic lava, the felsic lava will just continue to build gas and heat and pressure inside the volcano until the volcano itself, when it erupts, completely explodes. This explosion event produces this extremely pressurized, superheated mass that we call a pyroclastic flow. Pyroclastic flows are what are pictured here on this image of a volcano from Iceland. Unfortunately, I cannot pronounce it. It's like the 12-syllable um, volcano that erupted a few years ago, blocking air traffic um, in and out of Europe for several weeks. So this flow is a pyroclastic flow. And again, it's superheated ash from the volcanic eruption, along with that debris, that rock buildup from that lava, that felsic lava that resulted. And so think of it like a landslide. Okay, this material is moving hundreds of miles an hour um, down the side of the mountain, superheated gas and ash, hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit, again, like broiler, like taking, a, taking your stove and putting on the broil option. That's how hot um, the air is and the ash is. So pretty much anything that comes into contact with this gets completely vaporized or destroyed. And so composite cones produce this type of volcanic eruption that's different than what we had with our mafic lava. So there's a distinct difference between these eruption styles. And again, it all goes back to the chemistry, how the minerals interact within the lava and how they change due to heat and pressure. No matter what type of volcano that we're looking at, regardless of the size or where it's found or any of that, all volcanoes have a few features in common. So the first thing that they have in, in common is their magma chamber. So again, it's a centralized cavity inside the volcano that's filled with magma, this molten rock material from deep within the earth. The magma will then, once it's active, it can cause the chamber itself, this cavity, to expand. And with that expansion, it can cause a seismic wave to be generated. The seismic wave then is what we feel on Earth's surface as an earthquake. So depending on how much magma is present, depending on how wide the magma chamber is initially, how big it is, uh, you can feel either a very severe earthquake as the volcano is going to start erupting or a smaller earthquake. So in the case of the Kilauea eruptions two years ago in Hawaii, those eruption events occurred because the magma chamber was reactivated uh, in portions underneath the Kilauea uh, volcano and underneath sections of the island. And so new fissures or chambers on the sides of the volcano had opened up. And so that, again, was due to a difference in pressure and temperature, and the magma chamber within had expanded. This expansion caused a very small earthquake of magnitude 4, which we actually feel more frequently uh, here in California. Uh, but it was a very small earthquake event, and that heralded the eruption to come. So usually when there's excessive earthquake activity around a volcano site, that's often monitored to determine when the next volcanic eruption will occur, but it's not always a tell. The next thing that happens is, so after the magma chamber fills with magma and it expands, Sometimes, because of the heat and pressure that's introduced into the area, the surrounding rocks that are in that hill or mountain begin to fracture. And as they fracture, they'll develop these channels where the magma can then move through the channels and out towards the surface. Now, every volcano has a central channel. And on this diagram, it's called a pipe. Sometimes it's referred to as a pipe. Sometimes it's referred to as a throat. So it's the central part of the volcano. That's the main chamber through which the magma moves. And that's what gets released during the eruption. So when the magma, remember, when magma rises to the surface and moves above the Earth's surface, it's no longer called magma, it's called lava. Now lava, again, has different rates of flow depending on its chemistry, depending on the heat and pressure involved. Um, but lava flows tend to make their way down the sides of the mountain volcano and can gradually build it up over time. 
In addition to that, after the volcano has erupted, that peak, the top portion of the volcano, essentially collapses and develops into a crater. And again, this is your source site for that lava. Now, some volcanoes, um, they don't erupt in such a way where there's lava that actually bursts forth and makes its way on the surface and flows down the side. In some cases, the craters of volcanoes can, are very deep and they contain what are known as lava lakes. So in some places on Earth, there's lava lakes um, where we can see the lava flowing and moving um, continuously. So I'm going to show you some videos on Canvas that have examples of this lava lake. There were a couple scientists and entrepreneurs that went down inside a lava lake and uh, monitored and measured uh, changes in its temperature and pressure. And actually, some of their camera gear completely melted uh, from the heat itself, and they were hundreds of feet away um, from the lava lake. So that just gives you a sense of how hot um, the lava is once it comes out. So once a volcanic eruption occurs in addition to lava, there is tons of debris in the form of usually volcanic ash, smoke, and those gases that are very toxic. So sulfur-rich gases, carbon-rich gases, uh, low carbon dioxide gas, carbon monoxide gas, uh, methane gas, all of those will be released and produced during a volcanic eruption and trace amounts of water vapor as well. So all of that will collect and be ejected into the atmosphere after a volcanic eruption has occurred. Shield volcanoes are absolutely immense. Some of the largest shield volcanoes on our surface are the volcanoes that actually consist of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, each, the main island of Hawaii actually uh, can house hundreds of Mount Everest within. So that's a sense of how large um, Hawaii is. Shield volcanoes have a low profile. They develop into this wide, gently sloping hill rather than this ominous looking volcano that we typically would expect to see maybe in the movies or something like that. So when shield volcanoes form, what happens is their central crater or their uh, central magma chamber, superheated magma that's ultramific in composition will rise to the surface through a central vent. And after the eruption event occurs, we've got magma that is mostly mafic in composition that will gradually build up the sides of the volcano. So the sides of the shield volcano are very low sloping. This is different than what we have with the composite cone type volcano. So it's a very slow um, development of this volcano over time. And what's interesting about this is that these mafic lava flows, because of their mineral content, because they have more iron and magnesium in their chemistry, they tend to produce a different type of soil than what is in standard um, soils. And so it allows for different types of plants to grow. And so often around shield volcanoes, like in Hawaii, the reason why Hawaii is so lush is because, first of all, it's on a latitude of our surface where we get warmer, more humid air because it's in the tropics. And the second thing is, is that those islands tend to have that lush environment because of the soil itself. And that's again from the volcanoes. So volcanoes have this duality to them, which is why the Hawaiian people developed a series of gods that are associated with volcanoes uh, with volcanic eruption, both responsible for life and also death. And this is true on a scientific level as well. So from a scientific perspective, uh, that we've got shield volcanoes, the superheated magma itself can generate not only extremely devastating uh, lava flows and lava chambers, but also that can destroy tons of cities and things like we saw with the Kilauea eruption, but also in turn, um, as that lava solidifies into basaltic rock, it will eventually break down to develop very fertile soil. So we've got life and death together um, surrounding volcanoes. In fact, most volcanoes are deceptive in that they tend to have this beautiful forest or lush um, environment surrounding them. And unfortunately, some of these volcanoes are still active and like Kilauea had shown, um, we just never know uh, when the next eruption is going to take place. So often shield volcanoes are developed along divergent boundaries. Sometimes they're associated with hotspots like we have with, again, uh, the Hawaiian Islands. And shield volcanoes from their eruptions tend to develop the igneous rocks, obsidian, and basalt. 
Then we have composite volcanoes. With composite volcanoes, they're also very large. Uh, so the only difference here is that composite volcanoes develop these distinct peaks that are very steep. And these steep sides are due to, again, the way in which the inner workings of the volcano occur. So think of now composite volcanoes, they're instantaneously ominous. So here we've got an image of uh, parts of Mount Shasta. Uh, and if you look in the distance, right, it looks like something from Lord of the Rings or something like that. Think of Mount Doom or something like that. So those types of volcanoes often what we think of, I think of volcano and those are composite cone type. Composite cone volcanoes, they have a mafic magma chamber. But on the outside, they develop a felsic lava. So recall what I mentioned to you previously about felsic lavas. They absorb a lot of heat and gas. And so when those eruptions take place, there's more of an explosion rather than a gentle eruption style. These volcanoes are often found along convergent plate boundaries. And they're especially close to our subduction zones on our surface. So we get composite cones in this way. An example of a composite cone would be Mount St. Helens, which is part of the Cascade Mountain Range. Um, that volcano last severely erupted in 1980. And the eruption from that produced volcanic ash and gas that rained down in the cities uh, in Washington state for a long time. Uh, that ash actually circulated the globe at least twice. The eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE, that eruption event was so massive, it was recorded by two um, early geologists at the time, Pliny the Elder and Pliny the Younger, and their recordings of Mount Vesuvius stated that they could see the eruption, you know, meters in the air, in other words, miles in the air for us. So about six or seven miles up, there was this huge um, cloud of gas and dust and debris. They were able to witness it. And unfortunately, this cloud of gas and debris rained down on the city of Pompeii um, in 79 CE. And that entire city was completely cloaked in volcanic ash and dust, and it solidified in places into the igneous rock pumice. So pumice actually rained down on the citizens of Pompeii in 79 CE, and it's what preserved them. The volcanic ash flowed in and completely preserved that entire city. So uh, the hundreds of people that could not escape the eruption event, uh, their entire city, so all of the buildings, uh, their paintings, uh, their frescoes, all of the ovens and everything, uh, completely preserved uh, in that volcanic ash, like a moment in time. And that entire site, a World Heritage Site, unfortunately, um, is still an area where people inhabit. So unfortunately, a lot of, again, volcanic areas, because of the uh, tough or the volcanic ash and debris that are produced, these can develop very fertile soils and fertile environments. So often near composite cone type volcanoes, we have a lot of lush forests and things. And this is especially true near Mount Vesuvius today. There's over a million people that live at the foothills of that uh, very same volcano that erupted thousands of years ago. Often uh, with these volcanic eruptions, we get andesitic and rhyolitic flows uh, along with those pyroclastic flow events like we have that I described to you uh, previously. The next two types of volcanoes I'm going to share with you, they're much smaller in size. So think of a hill rather than an immense mountain. Cinder cone volcanoes are the first ones that we have, and they are ultramafic magma that solidifies into a mafic lava. And the mafic lava that's produced is very frothy, um, and it solidifies into the igneous rock scoria. So our scoria and superfine um, ash result from this type of eruption. So cinder cones are smaller volcanoes. They tend to erupt only once, and then they become dormant or extinct. So their inner chamber is not that large to begin with. Uh, and so they tend to produce, again, a lot of scoria and volcanic ash uh, from their eruption event. Finally, we've got lava dome volcanoes. And lava dome volcanoes are deceptive in that they're small, but they're incredibly deadly. Uh, so what happens during a lava dome eruption is that these volcanoes, when they erupt, they actually collapse. And this collapse generates a feature that we call a caldera. So a caldera is like sections of rock that have actually collapsed inward. And this can cause an immense uh, pyroclastic flow to occur. These volcanoes are sometimes referred to as parasitic cones because they're often found inside the craters of composite cones. So that's 
again, that gives you a sense of how large uh, the composite cones actually are. So these volcanoes can sometimes serve as kind of like a cap on the inside of that crater. And so think of it like taking a pressurized two liter bottle of soda and you shake it really hard and you leave the cap on. Uh, when this happens, of course, it's going to explode. Um, it's going to explode everywhere and in much the same way. That's essentially what happens with these volcanoes acting as almost like a cap. So going back to the volcanoes that we learned about on the very first slide, I want to talk briefly about those. Mammoth Mountain is part of a region that we call the Long Valley Caldera. It's a series of lava domes that collapsed hundreds of thousands of years ago. And with that collapse, it generated not only parts of Mono and Inyo Valley, but also covered the entirety of the Western 11 United States in volcanic ash. That layer of volcanic ash is preserved as a deposit that we call the Bishop Tuff. So Tuff is another name for tufa, which is a type of volcanic ash uh, that it contains uh, pyroclastic type debris. And so this tuff, this layer extends pretty much through uh, most of Southern California all the way out um, towards parts of Utah, Arizona, just going all the way out towards Texas. Um, so just all of the uh, Western 11 were blanketed in volcanic ash from that event about 600,000 years ago. Then we've got Yellowstone. So Yellowstone National Park is not in California. Um, it's part of Montana and Idaho, Wyoming. And that national park is actually situated right on top of a caldera. So remember, caldera is formed from lava domes that collapse. And so that caldera is still has still has an active magma chamber underneath it. And that magma chamber is feeding into regions of groundwater. And this creates what are known as hydrothermal vents. And that's what we perceive as geysers. So these geysers will erupt fairly frequently and continuously. And that's because of that continuous source of heat that's provided from that massive magma chamber under the surface. So Yellowstone National Park is an example of what we call a supervolcano, and it's also an example of a hotspot. So that entire caldera region is just part of the massive supervolcano that sits on the North American continent. Underneath that, again, is this huge magma chamber that's developed over millions of years, and it's still active today. Now, we monitor all of the major volcano sites around the world continuously. The United States Geological Survey and other organizations are continuously monitoring earthquake activity and volcanic activity, gases and things that are released prior to eruption to kind of give a sense of when the next big eruption will take place. But again, keep in mind that this kind of activity has been going on our surface for billions of years, um, that we can track it with only so much certainty. And volcanoes are essential not only to life on Earth, but also to developing our landscapes that we see today. So volcanoes are still around and the majority of them are still active and that's for better and also for the worse. In the next lecture, uh, we're going to review uh, these concepts. So go ahead and check that out on Canvas and I will hear from you at the next lecture point.